Good morning. If you have a Bible, please open it with me to James chapter 1. We're going to be talking today about finding joy in the struggle. And I want to welcome those who are joining us today by, from our Olive Drive campus. Now, it's going to be real helpful for you to keep your Bible open today as uh, we're going to be looking very closely at these verses. And, you know, uh, we're not going to have time to throw every, every time I reference a verse, it won't be on the screen. Uh, so it's good to have a copy of God's Word for yourself, so you can look for yourself, what is God telling me? Now, last week, we kicked off a new series on the book of James, and as we're going to find out, James is all about living out the Christian life. Now, while much of the New Testament is about our way to God, James is actually about our walk with God. What does a life that surrendered to Jesus actually look like? James, by the inspiration of the Spirit, is going to tell us. Now, if we had to boil down what the book is about, it's about how real faith works. That faith is not just merely intellectual ascent, but it's deeper than the mind because faith always leads to transformation. Now, a sub-theme of the book, perhaps, or just another way of thinking about James is that it's wisdom for life. It's like the book of Proverbs in many ways of the Old Testament. It's wisdom <clears throat> for the Christian life. Now, the first bit of wisdom that James gives us relates to the trials of our life, those painful struggles that we all face. So we see James chapter 1, verse number 2. He says, my brethren, or family, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, some people think that when they become a Christian, that that's going to solve all of their problems. <laughs> well, ultimately, and eternally speaking, it solves all of our problems. But here in this life, the troubles of life don't just disappear because we love Jesus. The Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. That means the problems of life come upon the good and the bad alike. So here's the cold hard facts. Struggles and challenges in life are universal. James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He does not say if you fall into various trials. He says when you do. If you live long enough, you're going to experience pain and suffering and hardship. Life is hard, isn't it? And sometimes life is downright painful. If you remember from last week, James is writing to Jewish Christians who had been scattered from Jerusalem to other cities because of persecution. And they faced incredible trials and oppression to those cities that they landed in. And later in James, we're going to see how some of them were being exploited by rich landowners who weren't paying them their fair wage. And that was a hardship. But it wasn't their only hardship, because James says we fall into various trials. That word various is, uh, it means variegated. It could be translated multicolored trials. In fact, in the Greek Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, this word various is used to describe Joseph's coat of many colors. James is saying our trials come in all kinds of different sizes, shapes, and colors. There's financial problems and, and grief problems and marriage problems and parenting problems and school problems and work problems and legal problems, physical problems, emotional problems. We got a lot of problems, don't we? And James says we fall into these various trials. We don't plan them. We don't schedule them. They come upon us oftentimes unexpectedly. Now, Pastor Phil told me one time, he said, Andrew, remember when you preach... Everyone's having a hard time all the time. <laughs> what he basically was saying is life's never going perfect for anyone. When you finally seem to get your marriage struggles uh, together, well, then something pops up at work. Or a problem arises with your kids. They do something that absolutely breaks your heart. Now, Pastor Phil's dad used to say it was right to plow one time and it was off to dinner. That's an old farmer joke. But what it means is it never gets just right, does it? And even if it does, it's hard to capitalize on it. Life is hard. 
But what complicates it even more is that our problems are often interwoven, aren't they? They're compounding. They come in clusters and waves. You, you lose your job, and that creates financial stress within uh, your marriage, and it creates marriage problems, which in turn sometimes creates parenting struggles. It's a domino effect in life. Take grief, for example. A person who's in deep grief is vulnerable to other problems. Sometimes they allow that grief to create bitterness or, or anger in their heart, and that spills up out typically in every sphere of life, into every relationship. Certainly, uh, it typically spills out into one's closest relationship. Now, the point that James is making is that God will take the trials of our life, no matter how trivial or how life-altering they might be, and He will use them in our lives if we let Him. In other words, there can be purpose in our pain, purpose in the struggle, purpose in the trial. Now, in verse number two, James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And that sounds a lot like the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount to me. In Matthew chapter five, verse number 11, Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, or in other words, have joy and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Now, Jesus was saying rejoice because there's a future reward. There's a future purpose that exists in heaven for you. But James is not talking here about the future reward Jesus was. He's talking about the reward and the purpose that exists in this life. Now, at first glance, joy in the middle of suffering seems irrational, doesn't it? But James provides the rationale. Now, before we get to the rationale, let's talk about what this does not mean. First off, this does not mean positive thinking. This is not a cockeyed optimism. The joy that James is referring to is not superficial. It's not surface level. level. It's substantive. It's real. It's deep. Now, this also doesn't mean that the trial itself is joyful. When you stand over the open grave of a loved one and they lower their body six feet under the ground, I can tell you it's not a happy experience. And it's okay to cry. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to to have pain. James is not saying in the midst of those situations, you know, put a smile on your face, act a little bit giddy while you're suffering. No, not at all. So what is James saying when he says, count it all joy? Well, this word count, some translate it consider, is a counting term from the ancient world. It has to do with analyzing one's assets and liabilities. Let's say you sit down to work on your finances, maybe with your spouse, and you make uh, two lists, two columns, an asset column and a liability column. Now, your assets are all the things that you own that increase your net worth. Maybe you own a house or a car, things of that nature. Your liabilities are all the bills that you have and the cost and, and the debt that you might have, the things that you owe. Now, James is saying that trial that you are going through, you think it's a liability, but don't count it in the liability column of life. I want you to count it in the asset column of life. Count it as joy. Now, why? James is going to tell us. Because the trial that we are facing, no matter how costly, can actually have appreciating value in our life. It does not have to have depreciating value. In other words, the end result of the thing that you're going through can actually become a good thing, or good can come from it. Now, notice I said the end result can be a good thing. I'm not saying the trial or the event itself is a good thing, but God has a way of taking things, awful things, evil things, horrible things, and transferring from the liability column of life to the asset column. Now, in the Old Testament, Joseph, in the book of Genesis, was sold by his brothers. He was mistreated in an awful way, sold into slavery. And later, his brothers appeared before him. And Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Romans chapter 8, Paul says in verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Now, Paul doesn't say all things are good. That would be ludicrous. He says God works together for good, all things, to those who love Him. 
And essentially, that, I think that's what James is saying. He's saying there's a bigger picture you need to be aware of. In the midst of your pain and your struggle, all you can see and all you can feel is that pain in this moment. But what you need to do is you need to step back just a little bit and know that God is going to take your pain and your struggle and he's going to do something good with it in you. You know, proper perspective is so very important to have in life. You know, Jesus had a proper perspective when it came to the cross. I mean, he knew the impending pain that awaited him on the cross, and I think he dreaded it. We, we know that the night before he was crucified, he spent the entire night in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to the Father, and he said, perhaps this cup of suffering can pass for, from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew the pain that was coming. And I think when it came, it was as bad as he ever imagined it would be. When they whipped him with a cat of nine tails and ripped open his flesh from his back and his ribs, that was a joyful experience. It was painful. When they shoved the crown of thorns on his head, that wasn't good. It was painful. When they nailed him to a cross and he suffered and bled and died for us, that was not good. It was painful. But look what God says to us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. It says, looking or telling us to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the, what? Joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, in other words, he's our example, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. God is saying, don't grow weary and discouraged with your suffering. Think about Jesus. Look to Jesus. He suffered and he went to the cross and he actually went with joy in his mind. He counted suffering not in the liability column of his life, but in the asset column of his life. Now, how did he possibly do that? Well, it's because he knew that the trial of the cross would produce the salvation of the world. He was able to look through all the pain to the end result. And that's what James is saying. Your trials are going to produce something, so just go ahead and count them as joy. Not just a little joy. He says, count them all joy. This word all means pure. Count it pure joy. Count it unadulterated joy. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to understand that even in the midst of the struggle and the pain and the trial of life, God is at work in you. In fact, finding joy in the midst of trials comes from knowing that God is at work. When you're able to to, to see something good or something at value at the end of a dark path in which you're on, you're going to be able to have and experience some joy by focusing on the end, that God is truly able to bring something good out of something bad. In the midst of our pain, we've got to know there's actually purpose, or there can be. Now, God may not have caused the trial that you're going through. It may have been caused by sin or just living in a fallen, broken world that's messed up by sin that we lived in. It's just a messed up place. God may not have caused it, but He did allow it, didn't He? And sometimes that's a hard pill for us to swallow. We don't understand all the reasons He allowed it. I mean, we couldn't possibly understand the complexities and the reasoning of running the world. That's above our pay grade. But I can tell you one of the reasons He allowed it. One of the reasons God allowed whatever trials in your life has to do with how He's going to use it in your life. Now, the word, very word trial and test in these verses, those words imply purpose, don't they? And, and the purpose is not negative. The purpose is actually positive. When our kids were babies, we put all four of them through ISR, which is infant swim. Both sets of grandparents had a pool. It just made sense. So every day in the summer, Kelsey would take our babies to ISR. And the instructor would work with them in the water over a, every day for a period of weeks. Now, in order to graduate, we would clothe our baby, fully clothed, put shoes on them, and the instructor would toss them in the pool. Can you believe that? A little frightening for Dad to watch. But each one of our babies, I watched them go under the water get tossed overboard, and then they flipped their little baby bodies over, finding the surface, and came up out of the water, face up, screaming, but gasping for air as well, right? Now, here's the question. 
why in the world would we put our babies through that? Why would we put them through that test? Not so they would drown. It was actually quite the opposite. We put them through those weeks of tests so they would learn to float and learn to swim. We put them through the graduation test to what? To prove they can swim. And it's the same with God. But the case of our trials, the test does not prove our faith to God. He already knows our faith better than ourselves. Who does it prove it to? To us. When we go through the tests and trials of life and we cling to God, our faith and our confidence in God is strengthened and is confirmed in us. And it's validated in such a way that we grow stronger. Now, we've been talking about the purpose that God has in our trials, but the question is what purpose? Well, James tells us. Verse number three, he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, we're going to look at some of the details and break this down here in just a moment, but the first thing I want to see is the whole, that these verses show that God's purpose in our trials involves a process, doesn't it? Now, we don't like that. We want instant results. I mean, we live in, a, live in a microwave culture. We want it now, instant gratification. We don't like to wait long for anything. We want the product without the process, and we're willing to pay for it, aren't we? We go to a nice restaurant, you order a nice steak, and you want to pay for the product without the process, right? But just because you can't see the process doesn't mean there wasn't a process, because there was. There was a rancher with some land And he cared for that land, and he cared for that young calf that was born. For about a year's time, as that calf grew, he cared for that calf. There was likely a sale barn where that calf was sold. And then there was a feedlot to fatten that calf up. And then, well, we'll just stop right there for those of you who can't handle the process. There's a step after the calf gets fattened up, I can tell you. There's always a process that goes into any product of value any product of worth, there is a process to it. And it's the same with Christian maturity. There's a process. We want to skip all the steps. We want the product. No, no, no. There's a process to get to the product. We can't skip the steps. So let's go through a couple of the steps that James outlines for us. The first thing that we see that trials do for us is they make us tougher, don't they? He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, a patient person is someone who can tolerate a lot, right? They can kind of endure a lot, maybe a lot of waiting. A lot, you know, mid, I think of people that work with middle schoolers as being patient people, right? So while I understand the translation, I actually don't think patience is the best translation here. I think the endurance would be a uh, word endurance would be a better one, uh, or maybe resilience. And I think if you really boil it down, I think what James is talking about is toughness, <laughs> that our faith is tough that it's resilient, that that no matter what comes its way, it just won't quit. My mind goes to Tom Hanks and the baseball movie, A League of Their Own. It was a movie about an all-American girls' professional baseball league of the 1940s. And if you don't know the movie, this might not mean much to you, but the coach, Tom Hanks, says to one of the girls on his team who was crying, he says, there's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball church family. There's no quitting on Jesus. There's no quitting on Jesus. Our faith is to have a a resiliency, a perseverance, and an endurance, a toughness to it. Now, what toughens up our faith? Trials do. Testing does. And when you think about it, God has actually designed that to be the case in almost every area of life. I know it's like that in the sport of wrestling that I'm accustomed to. One of the ways that you get better as a wrestler is live matches. The more matches a wrestler gets, typically the better they're going to be. They've got to be thrown into the fire, so to speak. Now, coaches, they can simulate some of that in practice, and they do. They design their practice to be a series of trials, a series of tests. They put the wrestlers through a, through a gauntlet throughout the entire practice. They put them in uncomfortable and and painful situations so that what? They'll pass the test when the tournament comes. That's the purpose. God is saying, I want you to count it all joy because you know. You don't think. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith is going to make you stronger. 
It's going to make you tougher. It's going to make you better. And do you know that just knowing that, if you just allow the, the truth of that to sink into you, it is going to be incredibly freeing. It is going to allow you to walk through whatever life throws your way with a completely different mindset, a completely different demeanor. And it, it, sometimes it, even, it, it affects us just in all kinds of ways. And it will actually allow you to have joy in the midst of whatever pain you have. Now, I remember a few times <clears throat> that people picked me up from wrestling practice as a favor from my mom. And they would look at me, and I typically had marks on various kinds on my face and my neck. My shirt was drenched in sweat. Um, I had braces, so I almost always had blood on the front of my shirt. And I remember them saying, why do you wrestle? That looks miserable. What are you doing? Why, why, why do you do that? Now, the truth is, it probably would be miserable to most people, normal people, but you've got to be just a little off to be a wrestler. <clears throat> I guess. I guess I was one of those people that was a little bit off because I loved everything about wrestling. I loved the grind. I loved the pain. And did you know I even learned to find joy in the midst of the struggle? Now, how did I do that? It's because I knew the grind was producing something in me. I was becoming better. I was gaining endurance. I was becoming stronger and tougher. And I was now going to be able to face the opponents that were going to come my way. And did you know God does the same thing? in our lives. In wrestling, we call it no pain, no gain. And that's kind of how life is. If we respond properly to the trials and the pain and the suffering and the struggles of life, and we don't allow it to, to break us and we don't quit, we will become stronger. We'll be able to tackle even greater obstacles that come our way. Perhaps you remember King David in the Old Testament. They, as a young boy, he slayed the the giant Goliath, right? Remember that story? He said, God prepared me as a shepherd boy when I had to take down the lion and the bear. God was preparing him. Now, lion and bear don't sound like small tests to me. It's not like kind of a pretty big deal. But compared to Goliath, the giant, the warrior, they were small tests. God uses our struggle to make us stronger. Even if you take a little caterpillar that's forming into a butterfly, and as that butterfly is emerging out of its cocoon, its chrysalis, as it's pushing out, if you see that happening and you, oh, I'm going to help that little guy a little bit, and you open that chrysalis just a little bit, it's never going to fly. In fact, it's soon going to die. Why? Because it's the struggle that it goes through of breaking out of the chrysalis that forces it to push the fluid out to the edges of its wings and gives it the strength to fly. And this is, it's the same in our lives. It's the struggle that allows us to soar in life. Verse number four, James says, but let patience or allow patience, remember patience, endurance, have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Here's our principle. God uses our trials to produce Christian maturity. James tells us what's at the end of the process in Christian character, because this word perfect has to do with being fully developed. The word complete has to do with being whole. Both words are talking about a maturity that's beyond the norm. See, God uses our trials to produce a toughness in us of our faith, and that toughness, in turn, is supposed to turn look at, look like, and turn into Christ-likeness. Now, Paul and Peter both said roughly the same thing about this process. Look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse number 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Look what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, you have joy. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various multicolored trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. 
So Peter's telling us basically the same thing about our tests as James does, but Peter gives us an illustration, doesn't he? He says our faith is tested by fire. Now this word tested was used in the process of purifying metals. They would take gold and they would stick it under the fire and they'd heat it up. And through this process of uh, of heat being heated up, the impurities would 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 rise out of it to the top, and then they would skim the impurities off the top of the gold, and they put it back under the fire, and they'd repeat this this process. They would do it over and uh, again until they could see the reflection in the gold, and then they knew it was complete. It was perfect. I think God allows us to go through the fires of life. And they hurt, don't they? Fires hurt. But he allows us to go through them. One of the reasons is that he uses them in our lives to purify us. Perhaps he uses them and purifies us until he can see the reflection of his son, Jesus, in us. But did you know that unlike gold, we have a choice in whether we allow trials to purify us. In fact, We do not get the benefit of our trial without a proper response. I don't know about you, but I want the benefit of the trial. i got to go through it either either way, and it hurts either way. I want the end result to result in something good that God's doing. Now, the opposite way of saying the point that I just said is our suffering is actually enhanced and prolonged without a proper response. You see, James says in verse number 4, but let allow patience or endurance to have its perfect work. You see, God's working, isn't He? And what are we supposed to do? Respond. He's working our lives. We're supposed to respond, to let Him work, to allow Him to do His thing. Now, God is working to make something beautiful through this process in our lives, but we've got to respond properly for it to take effect and have its perfect work, its perfect purpose. Now, the trials of life, truth is, they're going to toughen you up whether you love Jesus or not. They just will. But that toughness looks very different depending on how you respond to the Lord. Some people go through the trials of life and they become hardened. They become callous to life. They're miserable and most everyone around them typically is miserable. But they've learned to endure. They've learned to survive the difficulty and the challenge of life by just hardening and sometimes not caring. But the Christian who goes through those same trials is strengthened nonetheless to properly respond. If they respond properly, they grow tough and resilient while remaining soft to God and soft to people. Now, those people aren't miserable to be around, are they? They're a joy. If you've been around those people, you know they're a joy to be around because nothing that life throws their way can rob them of their joy. Now, the last point I want to throw out there for us is that we must seek God in the midst of our trial. Now, it's very important to know the process that God's working us through. But if you're in the midst of pain, if you're in the midst of a struggle and a trial in life, it's important to know where the end result is you respond properly. But the other thing that you really desperately need is just the presence of God. There's nothing like drawing close to the Lord. The Bible says, draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. we got to seek God in these moments. Now, we're going to look at it next week. But the very next verse in this chapter is about prayer. It's about prayer. So maybe you're going through it now. You're in the midst of of that cluster of trials, that domino effect. It's just hitting you left and right. And you're thinking, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond. Here's what you do. You draw near to the Lord. You seek the Lord. You take it to Him in prayer. You ask Him for wisdom, and you keep asking for wisdom. And guess what? I promise you, He promises us in the next verses, He'll give it to you. He'll give you wisdom. Now, I want to back up for just a moment to verse 2 before we close. James says, count it all joy. And that is an imperative in the Greek language. It means it's a command. And a command implies a choice, a choice to obey or a choice to not obey. So how do we have joy in the midst of our trials? 
We have to decide to have joy. We've got to make a choice. Oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit is the one who produces in us uh, fruit of the Spirit as we walk with Him, as we abide in Christ. All of that is true, but we must cooperate. And part of the cooperation of having that joy is to make a careful and calculated and deliberate decision to experience joy in the midst of suffering. Now, now that I walk through a couple of the steps, uh, I want you to see on the screens it as a whole. Here's the process that God uses. I'm not going to detail it out again, but I want you to see it as a whole. We experience trials in life, and that produces an endurance and a toughness in us. And if we have a proper response, it will lead to spiritual maturity, growth. And James says this process, consider all this joy. God is taking bad and evil and working them together for good. Paul told the Philippians, He who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Now, what is the good work that God has begun in us? The good work that He has started us in the day of our salvation is He is conforming us to look more like Jesus. And one of the ways He accomplishes His work is by allowing the irritations of life and sometimes just the downright pain. Now, as I understand it, an oyster, when it gets a little speck of sand under its shell, it's irritated to no end, and it can't shake it. It can't get rid of it. And so instead, it's forced to endure it. And one of the mechanisms of its enduring is that it forms this crust around it to lessen the irritation. And that process ultimately leads to formation of a pearl. That's how we get a pearl. Now, here's the deal. We all want our life to be a pearl, but we don't want the process. And James is telling us by the Spirit of God that all those irritations of life, all of those even life-altering events of your life, if you respond to them the right way, God will use them to develop you into a beautiful, beautiful pearl of His amazing grace. And so my encouragement to our church family today, all of us going through very different things, but all of us going through stuff, my encouragement is, let's know what God is doing behind the scenes and what God is wanting to do in our hearts. And let's go ahead and count it all as joy. Now let's bow together in an attitude of prayer, if you will. This is a holy moment in the life of our church. I ask that distractions be limited. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And it's a time to respond to the message, to to what God is doing in your heart. There's going to be pastors and other leaders here at the front. And it could be that you're listening to this message. And so much of James is about our walk with God. What's the wisdom of life? How how do we do this? Why do we do this? God's helping us. This is His Word. It's it's brilliant because it comes from God. That's all about our walk with God, but maybe you're here and you're saying, I don't know how to walk with God because I've never never found my way to God. I've known He exists. Deep down, I've known it. But I kind of thought maybe He was unknowable. Because he's felt unknowable in some ways to you. But the reason he's felt unknowable is because God cannot tolerate sin. And sin causes separation between us and God. But Jesus came to the earth and died on the cross to fix that problem. So that our relationship with God wouldn't have to be separated anymore. So it can be restored and we can be reconnected to him. And the only way that you're reconnected and you find your way to God is by believing in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's the way. And so I want to invite you to walk the path to God, to step out and find the way. His name's Jesus. You can receive him right now. It's not hard. It, It takes humility. But you just admit your sin and you open your heart 
to what God wants for your life, and you receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, you do that by faith, by, by trusting Him, confessing your sin to Him, admitting it. Just He already knows it, but you've got to admit it. Uh, it takes humility. Humble yourself before God. Admit it. Invite Him into your life, and He'll forgive you. But He won't leave you where you're at. You see, we all go through problems. None of us are exempt from the problems of life. But here's the difference between believers and unbelievers. God promises to be with us if we know Him. And God is inviting you, I believe, to get to know Him today. So I want to invite you to place your faith in Jesus. Or maybe you already have found your way to God, but you've not been walking with Him properly. You can rededicate your life to the Lord. Or maybe you're in the midst of I mean, it's struggle after struggle. It's pain after pain. And it's just like life is beating you up. I want to invite you to allow God to do the impossible in those horrific situations. And to turn those situations upside down. Maybe the situation won't change, but you will. You'll be given a strength and a resiliency and a toughness that you didn't even know was possible. Well, that comes from God. It's a gift. It's a gift. I want to invite you to receive the gift, to humble your heart before God and allow Him to give it to you so that you can, you can face this hard, difficult life in which we all live. Maybe you want to be baptized like others today or join our church. Maybe you want to come to these steps and pray. However God leads. As soon as I say amen, you just start walking forward. We'll help you, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your amazing grace. You are so good to us. Lord, yeah, we're still in the middle of a battleground of the, of the world, but you have taken steps. and You have won the victory, Lord, and someday you're going to come back and you're going to claim it. But you are giving us all patience to allow us time to get right with you and we are thankful for that I pray Lord that those you've extended patience to that are listening to this message <clears throat> would not squander that patience but would do business with you right now not wait another moment help and trust you Lord and I pray those that do know you but maybe haven't been walking with you like they should, I pray, Lord, that you do a work in, in them. You know, you know what's needed for their lives. And so I don't even specify in this moment, Lord, I just ask that you work. Make it clear to them by your Spirit. Lord, I pray that whatever you have in store for all of us and everyone listening, Lord, that you would do a great work. And I pray, Lord, for some listening today that have gone through some unimaginable pain. Lord, you know I've had some pain and some trials, but Lord, there are some <laughs> that have gone through so much. Lord, would you help them right now? Lord, we can't help ourselves. They can't help themselves, but you can't. Would you help them pick up the pieces of life? And would you give them purpose and give them joy? Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.